started. All right, welcome everybody to Builders Declare's 19th webinar, um, What on Earth is a 10-Star Home? My name is Hamish White, one of the founding members of Builders Declare and Director of Sanctum Homes, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, and I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging. With the upcoming changes to the NCC this coming September, we will see our code change from six star to seven star. So today's webinar is very timely. But why shoot for seven stars when you can achieve a, ten, a 10 star rating? But what on earth is a 10 star home and does it really work? On today's webinar, we are joined by energy efficiency expert, Jim Woolcock from Suho, and he'll explore what a 10 star home is, whether it works as intended, and if it also meets the strict criteria of passive house. Jim will cover the 10 star home, which is uh, Suho's uh, display home in South Australia. What it is, how does it work? What were the goals for the 10 star home? What does the data say? And comparing that hers and passive house, does the home meet the passive house international standards? Uh, a little bit about Jim. Jim Woolcock is a third generation construction expert who is, a pas is passionate about sustainability and energy efficiency. Jim has over 25 years of experience, both as a site supervisor in his earlier years and more than 15 years in building simulation. As a NatHer successor, Jim knows a lot about houses in the rating scheme and is capable of giving detailed advice on all building matters. Now leading a team of 25 working under the banner of Suho, Jim is keen to show the impact of high-performing buildings on Australian occupants and aims to create a better future for all. We don't actually have a sponsor for tonight's webinar, so I thought it would be a really great opportunity to give a huge shout out to the other founding members of Builders Declare. Without their help, this webinar is not possible. The Instagram and Facebook accounts would not be delivering you all valuable information and the podcast Sustainable Builders Yak wouldn't exist. So I want to give a massive shout out to the other six founding members of Builders Declare, Jesse from Glux Builders, Michael Lim from Michael Lim Builders, Simon from Sustainable Homes Melbourne, Brian from iSmart Builders over in Perth, Mick Murphy from Online Builders, and finally, Jeremy, Jeremy Spencer, the OG of sustainability and director of Positive Footprints. All right, let's kick off today's event. Uh, the information you're about to receive is based on the experience of the presenters and may not relate to your situation. If you'd like more specific advice, please get in touch with us via email. Today's webinar will be around about 45 to 50 minutes um, and we'll then have around 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions at the end. Um, I really would love uh, for you guys to fire as many questions as you can at us and we'll hope to cover them at the end. Um, all right, Jim, I'm going to throw it over to you. All right. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Hamish. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. We've put a lot of effort into the 10 star uh, house. So um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to um, wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to people about it. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, so a little bit about Suho and where the ten star house came from. Um, I've spent a lot of time doing natters, and uh, it's always sort of put together. But there is a difference between what the scheme is and what the scheme aims for, and what the natters software does and what it aims for. Um, and then I'll do a little bit of pre uh, a comparison between Natter's passive house and whether the 10 star house is a passive house or not. Um, and then I've got some uh, data about that we've uh, recorded from the 10 star about whether it works. Um, and then finally, I've got where well, there's a tool that we've been working on called Hubble, uh, which people can use to estimate their own uh, energy rating uh, very simply. Uh, and so I'll run, I'll run through that, and if people are interested afterwards, they can they can get on to Hubble and, and uh, get access to it and have a play with it. All right, so here we go. Uh, so this is an image of the Ten Star House. Uh, there's a website uh, there for it if you want to have a look. Um, 
So a lot of the aims of the house were to uh, build it on a on a on a standard sort of block. So it's on a 300 square meter block and in a standard sort of development. So it wasn't some uh, sort of experimental greenfields uh, greenfields idea. Um, so Suho is uh, the company I've, I've been uh, working in uh, for a long a long time now, and we've done a lot of energy ratings. Uh, over that time across the country. And so we've built up a whole load of knowledge about how the software sees, sees buildings in that time. Um, and as I'm sure uh, plenty of other people know, not everyone out there is interested in building high performance buildings. Uh, and so we've had plenty of time uh, over the journey uh, to deal with a lot of houses that um, for, you know, for various reasons, cost principally, uh, have just tried to scrape through the NCC. Uh, and so a lot of the 10 star house for us was about building something that we could show to uh, people, our clients included and say, hey, you know, here's a high performing building. This is how you can do it. Uh, and these are the, this is the, the outcome that you can get. And the house has been built for a couple of years. And in that time, we've had loads of different people from uh, governments through uh, people who are interested in building the house and then lots of industry as well, uh, builders and architects, designers, uh, to come and have a look at it, kick the tyres and, and see what they thought about it. So that's, that's the journey, uh, partly, partly because we could and partly a bit out of frustration about not being, not seeing what was going, not seeing this sort of house being built, um, but that's, that's it. Uh, and we tried, to build, we tried to build a normal house. Um, and so this is another, another view of the house. So you can see the, you can see the passive, passive design uh, there already with the pergola. Uh, and the blinds on the upper on the upper windows, um, and here's another view another view from the inside. Uh, and so one of the things that we found in trying to build the house to a ten star to a ten star standard was that loads of other things became involved in it. To get it to ten stars, uh, the windows uh, need to be to such a level that the house needs to be quite airtight. Uh, and then if the house is too airtight, it's it's going to be um, it's going to be unhealthy. Uh, and so, okay, well, we need to put a, a heat recovery ventilation system in it. Uh, and then uh, NATERS is only about their heating and cooling energy. So what else, what else can we do? So we've done a, a, a quite a number of other things uh, inside and just looking at this uh, image, um, so pointing out some things. So uh, on the left-hand side around the windows, you can see the reverse brick veneer. So that's using its thermal mass, uh, using its thermal mass to keep the building warm. Um, the green uh, tiles that you can see above the uh, above the kitchen there are actually glazed bricks. So we were able to remove one layer of materials uh, there by not having to have tiles, by just having the bricks glazed. Uh, you can see the floors are dark colour, and I'll talk more about that later on. But that's that colour so that it absorbs more heat as the heat comes in through the through the glass. Um, and uh, what else what else can we see? So there's more reverse brick veneer there. Um, and uh, the, the ceiling uh, is sort of built upside down um, uh, so that there's a service layer. So if you, if you uh, have a look at uh, Hamish and, and Jesse's um, uh, webinar previously, they talked a lot about how to, how to build service layers into things so you're not getting the penetration. Um, and uh, you can see the, um, the HRV vents uh, in the in the wall there. So anyway, I, it's unfortunate I can't take you through a, a full tour, uh, but that's um, but that's uh, a few of the things that we've that we've worked on uh, in that sense. Uh, and here's a plan of the house. So again, we use the software to design it. Um, and another another of the builders declare webinars that I'd, I'd, I'd highly recommend is Jeremy's. Um, uh, acing a seven star. If you need to know about NATHERS and how it works and how to how to orientate your design, how to be the um, how to how to be the sun and the wind, then um, I highly recommend going and looking at that. But we use the software uh, here to design the house, so it's about 110 square meters. Um, you can see that there are three bedrooms in it and one one sort of one living area, uh, and so that was really coming out of the software. What did what did the design need to be? Uh, to um, reach the 10 stars. And then after that, how could we massage that design to make it a nice livable house? Um, and we've, we spend a fair bit on the finishes, as you could see from the, the, uh, see from the images. 
Um, and so it's it's um, it's turned out very well. We're very happy with the with the final final finishing of it and the feel of it. Uh, and particularly, uh, I think the thing I most enjoy about it is the is the air tightness and the HRV. It's a very busy road outside, and you close the close the door and with the with the decent glazing and the air tightness, you can't hear the can't hear the traffic, uh, but you can still you still get a feeling of the um, of the air moving through the the building. Uh, uh, from the HRV, it's it's a really lovely uh, feeling to. Of, it feels like a great building inside. All right, so that's the house in a very small uh, in a very small nutshell. Um, I want to go on and talk about matters and what it means to get the house to ten stars, and then we can talk about whether the ten star house actually actually works in the way that it works in the way that it should. Oh, I'll just go back to the I'll just go back to the house there. Um, we the only thing that we really needed to do on the smaller block was to bring the house back onto its onto its southern boundary. So north up the page, we brought the house down onto the southern southern boundary. We had to buy the two blocks so that we were allowed to do that. We built an eight star house uh, next door. Uh, we've sold that one since. But just while I'm here talking about the design, uh, just trying to get the design uh, specified like that. Uh, so we could make sure we got the sun in the windows, which again I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, but moving along to um, more boring things, uh, the so NATERS is two things. NATERS is a scheme uh, which is run by the federal government. It's the Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme, uh, and again Jeremy described this really well in his his webinar. Um, and what the scheme does is it sets a minimum number of stars that houses need to get to get their compliance through the through the construction code. So the optimal words there are minimum. So it's setting the minimum. It's not looking for high performance buildings at all. Um, and it's set through the construction code. And then separately uh, to that, in a sense, is the software that's been developed by CSIRO. Uh, and so that's the NATO software and there's four different parts. And the, the people in the scheme regulate and accredit the software for the star ratings. Uh, but if you're interested in high performance buildings, you can use the software uh, to go above the above the minimum. And so in talking about whether the 10 star house and um, uh, you know, is, a, is a Nathurs house uh, and or whether it's a passive house, sort of that division between the two, the two things I think is quite important. OK, so a little bit more on how the software works. Um, this, the part on the left-hand side with the plan and the windows and the insulation is what the builder or the designer provides. Uh, and they send, and then they give that to the assessor who puts it into the software. And the software has, the NATO software has a climate file for every location in it, which is very important. And it has an occupancy pattern. So it's like there's a formula family living inside the house. Uh, and so when the assessor clicks the go button, the software is trying to calculate what the temperature is in each room for each hour of the year. Uh, and it's getting the data from whether there's sun and wind and so on from the climate file for the location. Uh, and it's also opening and closing the windows and the blinds if there are any and so on. Um, and that's done by this formula family that live inside the software and run around and, and open and close these, open and close these windows. And so the output of the software is, oops, sorry, the output of the software uh, is this is these temperatures. And so the from the software you can get what the software expects the temperature to be in each room for each each hour of the year. Uh, and that's been that's been verified a number of times where people have built houses and monitored them and then checked to see whether the software is meeting those temperatures. And so that's the good that's the good part and can really be used to analyse high performance high performance buildings. Um, and then what happens uh, as far as the regulation goes is the, is the scheme takes hold of that, that information about the temperatures uh, and works out what a comfortable temperature range is, again, from the, uh, an average family, uh, and then uses that to try and uh, work out what the minimum requirement should be for that house. Uh, and that's where your six star, six star rating comes in. So, the, the software, as far as I understand, the software works well at predicting the temperatures, uh, but there's a few assumptions made when the software is, when the, when the scheme then takes those temperatures and turns them into a star rating. Uh, and principally it does that by setting some star, star bands and it says, okay, well, if your house is expected to use this much heating and cooling, 
uh, to keep itself within a comfortable temperature range, uh, then uh, it, you know it, it has this this star band, uh, and they're different for each climate. Uh, and so I've got a little chart here, um, and so the Natter's uh, star bands. Uh, this is for I've chosen a cold one, a, a temperate one, and a warmer one, um, and you can see that the allowance given by the government for each uh, each six star assessment is is different uh, depending on the location of where the of where the building is, and so I've put in uh, six stars, seven stars, and, and eight stars. Uh, and I'm concentrating on the seven and eight because that's when the building tends to get decoupled from the outside temperature. So as the outside temperature goes up, uh, the inside temperature doesn't. Uh, but it does show that if you live in, in Brisbane, because the weather's so much uh, nicer up there uh, and you're going to be comfortable in your house with a lot less heating or cooling than you are in, in Melbourne where it's so, so cold, um, you can see that uh, the allowance that's given by the government of what the minimum requirement should be for that six stars uh, is quite a lot more. So that's how the Natters, that's how the Natters scheme, scheme works. It uses this piece of software and then applies some rules to it and comes out with an allowance uh, uh, for us. Now, how does, that, how, does that relate to, how does that relate to Passive House? Um, and so I'm no passive house expert, and please uh, point out when we when we're going into the the uh, time uh, the question time afterwards. Please point out or I get this wrong. Uh, but um, uh, the th looking at the passive house criteria on the website, there seem to be four of them: thermal performance, energy demand, air tightness, and thermal comfort. Um, and so there were some heating and cooling demands there. Uh, um, some energy demands for the appliances, your air tightness, um, and then how many hours the building could spend over, 10 to, over 25 degrees if it wasn't heated or cooled. And these are all really great, these are all really great things, um, but does the Natter's software consider it? So yes, the Natter's software considers thermal performance. It doesn't look at energy demand at all. Uh, and so that's why in the new code, they're planning in bringing in uh, the um, whole of house assessment. And again, I refer you back to Jeremy's uh, webinar for a really good description of how that, how that works. Um, Natter software does have air tightness in it, but the allowance is like 10 or 12 air changes per hour. So it, the software considers it, but it doesn't reg the scheme doesn't regulate it. Um, and the thermal comfort is, is considered again, it's something you can get out of the Natter software, but it's not something that's regulated for. Uh, and so this is why I'm trying to trying to make the difference between the Natter software, which is good to use as a as a as a design design tool if you want a high performance building, uh, and the Natter scheme, uh, which only looks at the heating and cooling demand and sets a much lower barrier than the Natter's uh, than the Natter's does. And I've got a little I've got a picture for that. Um, and so this is the same, the same graph as we had uh, previously, uh, except I've put in, I've converted the, the Natters here, sorry, the passive house criteria is in kilowatt hours per metre squared per year, um, and uh, Natters is done in megajoules per metre squared. So it's a reasonably easy conversion to convert that uh, and so the green bar is the same across each climate uh, in terms of if this is the correct, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if this 15 kilowatt hours is the per meter squared per year is the correct amount, uh, then it's the same across each, each climate. Uh, but the star ratings differ by, the star ratings differ by, um, by climate. Uh, and so, that's one of the differences between the two, between Natters and, and Passive House, is that use of the climate file to uh, assess the amount of heating or cooling that's needed changes as the climate file changes, uh, rather than having a a, um, a a static value that's the same for everywhere. Um, and the, the difference there, I guess, is that um, it, that can change your construction cost, cost quite markedly. 
So that if you don't need to go as, I mean, if you need to get to eight stars in Melbourne, that's one, one cost, but in Adelaide, you may only need to get to seven and a half stars to reach the, reach the passive house. Uh, standard um, and of course in in Brisbane even six stars if this is correct even six stars is is about along those along those lines um, but the I mean the other part of it is uh, with the passive house is you can get certified uh, and it's much more looking at the construction of how you actually go about doing it whereas Natters is just a desk exercise that says okay well this is what you're planning to do um, and this is the amount of you know, insulation and so on that you've got in there. And this is the result that you should get uh, at, that, at that point. Um, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with how the building actually gets constructed. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no checking of the buildings once they are, are constructed. That'd be a lovely thing in terms of getting better performing buildings actually on the ground. That would really help. All right. So um, then uh, just going on to the 10 star house again, after that sort of comparison or pointing out the differences between the Natters and the, the passive house. Is, so here's the entire star band for, for Adelaide. So, you know, zero stars is nearly 600 um, uh, megajoules per meter squared. Uh, six stars uh, down here is, um, is, the, is 96. Uh, megajoules per meter squared and um, so I think passive house is somewhere around uh, seven and a half stars from the slide uh, previously uh, and the 10 star house is allowed to use three uh, megajoules per meter squared and most of that I think is about um, uh, most of that I think is about um, a, a dehumidification so taking the water out of the air as you cool the cool the air down because you can't get away can't get away from that and so uh, back in the day uh, when we were doing five star ratings when that was the maximum there was no uh, there was no carrot to keep uh, to make people move towards or let them understand how well their buildings were were, were performing uh, and so they changed the ratings to go from zero to ten. Uh, and so apparently a 10 star house should keep itself within a comfortable temperature range all year round with no heating or cooling uh, at all. Uh, and it was, a, I mean, as a desktop exercise in terms of trying to uh, design the building and specify it, um, I'd change a window and I'd lose half a megajoule, which would drop me down to 9.9. .9. Uh, and I'm not sure if people would be interested in coming and seeing a 9.9 .9 star house webinar. So. Um, so we had to get it back up to 10. So that, that's that, uh, that exercise was quite, was quite frustrating uh, uh, in that, but that's as low as you can go in the current software. I think if they do change it for the new, with the new code, uh, I think the, uh, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be somewhat more, be much easier to get up to that 10 star, up to that 10 star level. Um, just as an aside, other work, other, other um, research work that we've done shows that the building will um, at about this sort of seven, seven and a half, eight star level, that's the sort of level that the building will um, stop following the outside temperature. So as the you know, six star house, as the outside temperature goes up, then the inside temperature goes up almost automatically. Um, it's obviously somewhat better than a you know, three star house or, or whatever, but it's not all that much. It's really not until you really hit the seven and a half which funnily enough is the same as the passive house, um, uh, means that the, the, as the outside temperature goes up, the inside temperature stays constant. So I don't think I'd ever build a 10 star house again. I think that the sweet spot is, is around about this eight star, eight star level. Uh, it's just too hard to get it down to, down to 10. You've got to spend too much money on the glazing and the insulation and so on. And the, the design has to be, has to be exact um, and the start has to be exact. Um, and if, if, I was, if I was building a normal house or building a house now, I'd stop at eight. And if I had extra, any extra money over, I'd go and you know, buy an electric car or something to reduce my uh, overall uh, you know, carbon footprint rather than, uh, rather than, uh, looking, at the, um, rather than looking, at the, uh, looking to go to 10. Okay, um, and uh, so just talking about what a 10 star, the difference between a six star house and a 10 star house uh, means as far as the software, as far as the software sees it. Um, and I guess just making a little, uh, you know, a little comment there that a lot of this stuff is coming out of the software. And while the temperatures have been, have been, have been checked, it's really a bit about how the software sees the world. 
But anyway, on the left-hand side, what you're looking at on the left-hand side is a six-star house. Um, and you can see that, and what the graphs show is the number of hours for the entire year that the living area spends uh, at those particular temperatures. So you can see it spends, say, 50 hours at 13 degrees. Uh, and these are the these hours are the ones where the where the software thinks that people are actually the formula family are actually in the living room. So it's between 7 a.m. and midday. I'm sorry, midnight. I think. Anyway, so the the, the spread of temperatures uh, is between 13 and, and 36. Uh, the the comfortable temperature range between 20 and 25 is probably where the at least half or the majority of the time is spent. But there's still considerable time spent. Uh, below that, um, below that uh, uh, 20 degree uh, comfortable temperature range, uh, and there was an article recently in the in the newspaper saying that the World Health Health Organization was saying that anything below 18 degrees wasn't wasn't good for you. Anyway, uh, but you can see how how wide apart those are. Uh, if you look at the 21 degrees, then that that, that spends about the the uh, or 20 degrees the building spends about a thousand hours there. And so then looking at the 10 star house uh, on the right, you can see that the graph has been compressed and all the hours are now between 19 degrees and say 28 or 29. Um, the reason it's allowed to get up there above the 25 uh, is due to the ceiling fans. So the software sees ceiling fans as allowing the temperature to go up a few degrees uh, and the people still to be comfortable inside there. Uh, but you can see at say 22, uh, there's 2,400 hours uh, as opposed to the, you know, uh, for the highest one as opposed to 1,000 on the other side. So there's a difference in the difference in the graph there. Uh, but visually, it's quite easy to see that the all the hours have been squashed into a much more comfortable temperature range uh, than uh, a six star house a six star house would have. Okay, uh, and this is um, a year's worth of measured data. Um, and so this is uh, the, the pink line or the lighter red uh, is the outside, highest outside temperatures. The darker blue line uh, underneath is the minimum temperature. And then the uh, blue and red lines that are on top of each other are the inside temperatures for the house. Now, Nat says uh, 20 to 25 degrees as its estimate. And if we put a little box in there so that you can see that, uh, you can see that in the summertime, uh, with no heating or cooling, um, it, with the HRV running though, uh, it, did, it kept itself between its 20 to 25 degrees uh, all year round. Uh, but it got a bit cold in the it got a bit cold in the winter, so we weren't quite enough we weren't getting quite enough sunshine in through those north facing windows onto the dark concrete floor. The house was shut up, so it's been used as a display, and no one was living there. So I don't think it would take much, uh, perhaps some people living in the house, maybe if they had a big dog or something, uh, to um, to warm the warm the house warm the house up and get it up to that level it's certainly much better than the uh, outside outside temperature um, however it's not quite inside what the net has uh, said it would would be uh, at 10 stars um, here's another graph of the same here's another graph of the same thing um, but just the hottest uh, days in in um, in the year uh, so we monitored the outside temperature and you can see this is a pretty standard uh, Adelaide uh, heat spell where it gets up to 40 degrees for a few days in a row uh, and normally in a in a house with high thermal mass the thermal mass will heat up and by the third or fourth uh, day you're taking your mattress out to sleep in the backyard because it's so hot inside uh, but you can see that the, the 10 star house got up to 26 uh, as a maximum so having spent uh, you know, nearly 20 years talking, talking to people about this to actually have this graph and be able to say well uh, it actually does work. Uh, is really is really quite a, a nice a nice thing. Um, and then uh, in in the winter time, uh, again, it didn't stay at 20, which perhaps it, you know, which is what the software said that it should do. It's certainly uh, above that uh, above the outside um, uh, above the outside temperature. And you know, perhaps some people living in the house might have might have pushed it up. But so that's the actual that's the actual temperatures versus versus what the software or versus what the software would 
would think. Um, and then uh, this is probably the slide where I'm going to get into trouble because I don't know perhaps enough about Passive House. Uh, but I just wanted to do a little comparison between a six star, uh, the 10 star house and would the 10 star house pass Passive House. And so uh, ceiling insulation, uh, just excuse me while I run through these, excuse the ceiling insulation, so R4 for a Nathurst house R10 for the 10 star, so that should pass the passive house requirements. Same for the same for the walls, um, reverse brick veneer there. Um, so the window specification, so they ended up as triple glazed windows with uh, thermally broken frames. Uh, there was user operable shading uh, on the 10 star. Now I'm not sure if passive house uh, requires that as an actual requirement or not, or it just falls under the normal uh, or falls under the requirement for um, uh, falls under the requirement for thermal thermal comfort uh, or temperature control. Um, floor colour, again, similar floor insulation. Uh, this was one at the time, I think, uh, Passive House required under floor insulation. Uh, so the Natter's software uh, in Adelaide, uh, because we've got a, a bit, it's a bit hotter, um, the, the house worked much better better with the slab on the ground rather than the slab on, on the insulation. Uh, and I think, I don't know for sure, but I think that's because you get a bit of a, um, a connection between the ground and the slab and that might absorb some of the heat through. Uh, and if you insulate underneath the slab, then you lose that and the, the rating goes, you know, it dropped me half a, half a star or something uh, if I put it there. Now, if I try and build a 10 star house and uh, in, in, um, in, in a Melbourne climate zone, uh, as we did for um, the uh, Design Matters National uh, competitions, the underfloor insulation made a big difference in a positive in a positive sense. So again, uh, that's a climate uh, specific um, uh, requirement or climate specific um, uh, specification that you perhaps uh, need to be aware of. That in some in some cases, extra insulation works really well, and in other cases not so much. Uh, and so in spruiking the, uh, the, the natters, there's nothing like doing a simulation to work, work that out. Uh, we put efficient appliances in there. Uh, we put solar panels and batteries on. Again, I wasn't sure whether that was actually needed uh, in, in to pass a passive house. Uh, we just made the air tightness. Um, uh, so that works. Uh, we put in a heat recovery ventilation system. Uh, the thermal comfort is less than 10% under under 25, so that that works. Uh, we did a daylight study uh, on the on the house so that we could make sure that there was enough daylight in there. That's certainly something that we can see coming in. That's outside, perhaps, or certainly outside Natters, but maybe I'm not sure about whether it's outside Passive House or not. But certainly the the um, a couple of the the CASB councils down in Melbourne as part of their planning scheme are now requiring people to do daylight studies to make sure uh, that there's going to be enough, particularly for apartments, so that there's enough daylight coming, coming in. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of building a healthy and comfortable uh, house is getting enough, enough light in. So the, that's certainly, certainly something to look at. Uh, we spent a long time at the 10 star on the source of the materials where they came from the, you know, the timber and we tried to make it uh, as as locally get as locally made as we could, and, and lower carbon, and looking to the indoor air quality as well. So, uh, in terms of the types of paints and finishes that we put on, uh, put in the building. So again, I'm not sure if, if that's a passive house a passive house requirement uh, or not. And we haven't had it we haven't had it certified. So uh, we, we haven't haven't uh, ticked that tick tick that particular tick that particular box. So apologies for not knowing more uh, and being able to say what was what, but you can see how much or how different the, the 10 star is or how much extra is in the, in the 10 star house from, from the standard, standard six star. So I look forward to chatting about uh, that one in particular uh, at the end. All right, I've got, um, I'm, I'm doing quite well on my time. Uh, I've got this uh, Hubble to show uh, as well. So I'll need to pop out of my slides to do that. Um, so in, uh, through SUHO, we've done a lot of uh, research work over the time uh, and we've tried to get it out there so other people can, can uh, use it uh, as well. Um, and so Hubble is a, is a little offshoot 
from uh, from uh, Suho, and uh, it's called Hubble because it's looking for stars, which is a bit of a pun. But um, anyway, I'll get on with it so you can see what see what's going on. So I'm hoping you can all you can all see that. So here's that was the Hubble front page, uh, and when you log in, this is what you get. Um, and uh, one of the problems with the uh, energy assessing business is that uh, as energy assessors, we're separate from people that actually need the information, which is the designers and the builders. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's very frustrating as a designer or a builder to draw something up uh, and send it through to the energy assessor who then sends it back uh, and says, oh mate, it doesn't pass. Um, and then offers some uh, way of trying to fix it, uh, which perhaps isn't isn't the most either cost effective or meets the, with the client's requirements uh, and everyone can burn up a lot of time going backwards and forwards um, and also uh, the other area of assessors uh, for assessors that's difficult uh, is that when people send us through a plan um, especially after they've been to the council uh, and the council says where's your energy assessment and they're right at the end stage they spend all their money and they fall in love with their design uh, and then they send it through to us and we tell them that they can't have can't have that what they want so it can be a bit heartbreaking so we're trying to get out of that and make the energy rating part of things more transparent uh, for everyone so I'll just run through I'll just run through this um, so we'll go design uh, and we've tried to doing this we've tried to um, uh, we've tried to remove all the all the extra information so you can pick a single story or a double story building um, is the garage, garage attached uh, or not? So we'll leave it attached for now. Um, and you can set up a, a front door uh, orientation. Um, and then I'll just I'll tell you on 38 South Road. So this is where we are at Blue Home. Uh, and what this does is pick the uh, climate zone uh, for you. Click on next, and then uh, there's some more drop downs to answer. So we'll make it a Hebel, a Hebel external wall. Uh, we won't have all foil uh, for now. Uh, we won't have any. We won't have any roof foil for now or roof insulation. So that's the like anticon type of insulation. Uh, we'll put up two in the in the cavity. Because uh, in the in the Hebel wall, because that's a, a standard down here. Uh, steering insulation standard is about four, uh, and generally we don't have we don't have armed floor insulation. Uh, so colour the roof, put it in a medium. Um, and then floor coverings, which make a big difference to the energy rating. So we'll put carpet in the bedrooms and we'll put uh, polished concrete in the living areas. Um, so we'll leave off the ceiling fans and the roof ventilation for now. Um, and then uh, there's, a, there's the windows. So um, we'll put a bit of window in the north. Um, in the northeast, and so this is just the total window uh, area um, uh, for for the facade. Um, put a bit on the south, on the west. Okay, so that's added it up, and then we've got glazing. Uh, presets. I put in a single glazed aluminium standard. Uh, it gives the U value and the, and the solar heat gain, um, uh, and then that should give us a, that should give us a result. Uh, and so that's five and a half natters stars uh, out of ten. The accuracy for putting any old building in, as we're doing now, is about plus or minus ten percent, which doesn't sound like very much, but it could be as much as a as much as a star. However, um, uh, if you're doing a, a design for the building and you want to see whether you're at three stars or seven stars, you can certainly get that, that out of here. 
there's an estimate of a yearly energy bill uh, which will be improved um, when we get the final whole of house uh, uh, final whole of house calculation uh, out. Uh, and so there's an energy consumption and, and carbon and, and so on. Um, and there's an optimization here, here too. Um, and so this is giving uh, suggestions about uh, this is giving suggestions about how what you could do to the house to improve the energy rating. Um, and so there's anti-glare, there's adding waffle pod to the floor. Now I just went through an explanation why that doesn't work out later. So a lot of demonstrations, that's what it's all about. Um, floor insulation, including increasing the ceiling insulation and adding ceiling fans and so on, windows. Uh, so, but if we go back to the, um, if we go back to the windows, uh, here, uh, and so, okay, well, we're going to go for uh, double glazed UPVC. That's what the high performance, high performance windows do. That pushed that a bit hard, didn't it? Uh, and so, we change that. We can change the uh, change the insulation. Um, uh, two, so we'll pop in some ceiling fans. You can see that's, that's changing it, changing it. Uh, and I'll put in some uh, more ceiling insulation. Oh, I do that. There we are. And so we're getting up above the uh, getting up above the seven stars. So this is a this is a tool that um, you can send Hubble email, and they'll send you a login, and you can use it. Uh, it's just in the sort of beta phase uh, at the moment, so we're just we're keen on getting people in uh, to give it a go and uh, let us know what they let us know what they think about it uh, while we're working on um, uh, you know finalising the accuracy and, and putting in what's happening with the new code as that as that comes through. All right, so I hope that's uh, interesting. I'm getting near the end of my slides. Oops, I don't hit that. Sorry. Um, button. So going back to Hubble. Um, and so some uh, some take home messages from the information that I've tried to present. Uh, so I think that the NATHER software tools uh, work well in predicting thermal performance. Um, so they don't necessarily need to be used just to do six star assessments or your star rating assessments in general. They can be used to do predict what the temperatures are going to be inside the house. Um, and uh, they can, they can uh, certainly uh, show you the difference between one uh, method, building method or one material and another uh, and hopefully be able to reduce the cost. Um, Passive House is such a good way to prove as-built uh, performance. I thought um, uh, the Hamish and, and Jesse's webinar was just fantastic in the level of detail that you can go to to make sure that you, you get your air tightness and get your passive, passive house performance. That's what the it's what the uh, performance building industry has really needed is that piece about how to connect it through to actually getting the buildings built uh, on ground. Uh, if you're interested in Hubble, uh, send, look them up, send Hubble and Hubble an email, and they'll give you a login, and you can try it. Uh, and then uh, get more out of your accredited energy assessor. So, um, you know, we, we do this uh, stuff day in, day out, and we love to help people because most of the buildings that we, we go through, we're just processing. Uh, we love to help people. So um, get on to us or your, your energy assessor, and when they just give you a star rating and nothing else, say, well, I want to know about what happens if I get this material, or can you show me a way to get a better building uh, for for a less for a, for a, a lower cost, or can I use a different material that has a lower carbon uh, intensity? Uh, and so so spend some t some time on your design optimization. Uh, as assessors, we can save people if they want to reach a certain level of, of performance, whether you want to get up to ten stars or not. Um, uh, we can save people uh, on the on their on their construction by providing the you know, best performance for the least amount of least amount of cost. All right, and I think I've just got a couple more pictures of my of the ten star uh, to share, and I think that's me. I think that's me done, Hamish. 
All right. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I am just going to put an apology out there because my wife and kids are up the stairs there. Uh, I usually present this from my studio up the back, but the um, internet in Warrandyte today for some reason is not hitting my receiver. Um, Jim, thanks so much for that. It was super interesting. Um, I do have a few questions here, which hopefully we can um, we can answer. And, and if anyone else does any, have any other questions uh, in the last fifteen or so minutes, please pop them in the question or the on the chat box, and we'll we'll try and get to them. Um, this is a question for me, Jim, because um, I'm sure uh, some people out there are interested uh, in knowing this too. But how does thermal mass work in a in a building? Uh, the the thermal mass uh, it works by absorbing the uh, absorbing the heat and then re-releasing it, uh, and so the the concept with the image that we're looking at is the windows on the left face north. Uh, in the winter time, particularly, we want the sun uh, coming in through those windows, and that heats up the heats up the thermal mass of the floor, uh, and then when the sun sun goes away, the uh, the floor re-radiates that heat back into the building to keep the building warm. Uh, and in trying to optimise that, we've put the bricks on the inside. So it's a reverse brick veneer house uh, so that the thermal mass is on the inside of the inside of the house um, uh, where it can be of use rather than uh, sort of on the outside where it can't. I have a little nerdy question for you. Did you use um, an internal air tightness membrane for this home? Yep. And then how did you connect the uh, bricks to the um, to the studs, if you had an internal air type barrier, or did you do it? Put it to the um, uh, offset buttons. Well, uh, you've got me. Um, uh, 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 I know that we got the air. I know that we got the air tightness. Okay. Uh, but as it's a, as it's a couple of years ago, I'd have to come back to you on the exact on the exact construction there, Holmes. No, it's all right. I thought I'd just throw a, throw a curly one at you. Um, so I'll, I'll try and get through some of these other questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the whole of house assessment that um, uh, Nat Hurst is introducing later on this year and what that what the difference is between the current assessment and the one that's going to be um, uh, used uh, later on this year? Yeah, uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet. So my understanding is that building ministers are going to meet later this month and then I think on the 1st of October they're going to release the new the new energy efficiency code uh, and so it's all a bit up in the air. What they have released so far uh, is is a, a whole of house assessment, which assesses the amount of um, energy that the house would uh, would use, depending on choices that you make while doing the assessment for what the appliances uh, for what the appliances uh, are. Uh, and so again, I refer back to you know Jeremy uh, Spencer's uh, had a really good. Um, a description of how this works. So if you really want the detail, go back and have a look at that. Uh, but essentially, the uh, the government seems to be wanting to give people a, a minimum amount of uh, energy of energy that is permitted to use in the house. And if they want to use more than that, they can, but they've got to offset it by putting solar panels on the roof. Uh, and so it's not a very it's not a very difficult uh, thing to meet. Um, if especially if your house is all electric, uh, if you put in uh, gas space heating uh, into the into the calculator uh, and you put in um, a, a gas hot water heating, uh, then that generally tips the balance. So if you put in an all electric house, so the thing passes um, uh, without without too much trouble. Um, thanks for that. Um, and this is from Erica uh, and. I think I consider myself as a passive house nerd. Um, so hopefully, between um, you and I, Jim, we can we can explain this. Um, can you explain why the energy demand is the same across all climates? I'm going to let you go first, then I'll give you my thoughts on this. Okay, um, uh, I think it's uh, for simplicity. Uh, I think uh, trying to do the star bands across the across all the climate zones for years is a nightmare. There's always someone that says well, this isn't right. It should be this or it should be that. Um, and I think for 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 us very if you which uh, the government's done it for I'm sure for political reasons uh, and because they're just looking for a minimum. Uh, but if you want a high performance building, I guess you want a high performance building across all climates. And so just putting on one, uh, just putting on one figure makes it simple for everyone. 
uh, and you know you know what's going on. There could be a little overhang of the the, the passive house uh, coming out of a colder climate where it's not as uh, it's not as vital for them to have a different figure because they're really just looking at the really just looking at the heating. Uh, so anyway, they, they would be. I, I, you know, that's all just my thoughts on it. There's no. There's no. Uh, yeah. Tip. Yeah. I think I think if you just referred specifically to the graph and why the passive house stayed at 15 kilowatt hours, that's the maximum um, heating load that, or heating demand that we can put on a building. So I guess that's just there just to rep, just to have an example of comparison between the star rating and how passive house works. Um, I guess each home in passive house, it's all tested and measured. So we just need to get under that um, 15 kilowatt hours. Uh, so it may actually change, you know, from house to house. That's just a sort of a constant um, comparison, which is what I'm assuming you put into the graph there. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was just trying to provide some equivalence between the between the two between the two schemes. Um, and it's, you know, I was uh, happily su surprised that the it came out at that sort of level where other research that we've done shows that you're really getting that. That um, the interior part of that or interior temperature of the house stops following the exterior, so it's 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 that or below. So you know it's it's certainly a very good standard. Um, do you know of any six-star homes that have been verified to meet the predicted performance? No, that's uh, as I as I mentioned during the during the presentation. That's the that's the bit that uh, it'd be really good to see that you're actually getting a building inspection uh, as people are putting on the internal linings of the building, so that it can be uh, shown that the you know the building um, the insulation's been put in correctly and all the other things that are in the NATO the correct windows are, are, are done. And I think there was a, a previous webinar uh, that you guys uh, have done. Uh, Hamish, which really went through that in great in great detail, which was fantastic. Yeah. So if uh, anyone wants to jump on to our last webinar with Anthony from Outlier, we uh, talked about why we should be doing as-built verifications. Um, uh, this is from Alexandra. Is there a published case study for an eight-star house in climate zone four? Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's sort of southern Australia, sort of southern Western Australia, South Australia and Victoria, so maybe southern New South Wales. Um, given it seems as the eight-star house is a sweet spot to aim for. So is there a case study? Uh, not as not as far as I not as far as I know. Uh, if I was going looking for that sort of information, I'd be going to the Your Home, uh, the Your Home um, uh, manual. Um, uh, you could try uh, try it out in Hubble. Uh, I know climate zone four is is can be a bit difficult because it's generally inland, um, and it gets. I mean, as as I'm sure people know, it gets very hot and very cold, um, so you don't have the influence of the sea to calm calm things down in, in a temperature in a temperature sense. So, if you're getting up to eight stars in that sort of climate, you're doing pretty well. Um, can you explain uh, more about how the daylight study is done? Um, again, it's a piece of it's a piece of software, um, and uh, you draw you draw up your building, uh, and you put in the the windows, uh, and it'll tell you what the lighting level would be uh, in each uh, you know on each square meter of the in each square meter of the building, um, and uh, I think the Casby Council set a minimum requirement for the amount of amount of daylight which you know you, you can put in the overshadowing from buildings and trees and, and things like that as well uh, so that you can make sure that you know the occupants in the building are getting a, a minimum amount of a minimum amount of daylight um, I just had to mute myself because I can hear my son singing upstairs while they have um, while they're having dinner so just excuse me if that happens again um, uh, this is a good this is an interesting question because I, I probably don't know the answer as to what um, uh, air tightness and eight star house needs, but uh, would an eight star house require an HRV system? I reckon it would. I think um, I think the it depends on on how you go about how you go about doing it. But the the six star you can still get away in the majority of cases with single glazed aluminium windows, uh, and in my understanding they flex and leak air. 
and that's where the that's where the uh, air movement for the for the six star house uh, six star house comes from. Uh, once you get to eight stars uh, or even seven, you need to go to double glazing, and the extra uh, framing that you need to support the weight of the glass and the glass not not flexing itself because there's two two layers of it uh, mean that you're going to lose a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, uh, sort of uh, ventilation that you were getting from the leaking windows previously um, and certainly there's anecdotal evidence of, of when um, uh, sort of seven eight star houses are built if people pay attention to the air movement uh, that they you know you can get um, you can get people getting headaches in bedrooms and these sorts of things because they're not getting enough uh, fresh air uh, into them and it's certainly, a, you know, in a sense, it's a, it's a, 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 a two-way thing there that, um, for, for air tightness uh, in that you, you want the air tightness because it's going to keep the energy efficiency uh, and you need, to, you need to test to see whether it is. But in testing whether you see whether you've got enough, you want to test to see whether you've not got too much. Uh, and in that case, you'll need some sort of external ventilation. Uh, and it, I, you might know more than me, Hamish, but it, it's difficult to find an air conditioner in a domestic sense with a fresh air makeup. I think they can are starting to produce one. Um, but apart from that, really the only way to go is with some sort of HRV system. Um, I mean, I'll, total anecdotal evidence, and this is just sort of uh, just chatter, chattering about amongst my colleagues that I, we, we kind of said anything under five air changes now, uh, um, we really need to seriously consider uh, putting an HRV in. Um, I know Cameron Munro would argue that you should put it in every home just because it's a you know a healthier environment. Um, but you know anything below five air changes, you really want to be managing first and foremost the moisture and humidity in the air, uh, and an HRV will do that. Um, but does it does do you test the air tightness on eight star homes, or is that just is that something that you tick in the NATHERS, or is that? Um, so so NATHERS doesn't, NATHERS, you can't, on the surface of it, you can't change it. They're just starting to bring that in. It'll probably come in with the, with the next code change. There'll be a change to the, to the software. Technically, it's quite difficult the way they've got their software set up. Technically, it's quite difficult for them. Um, so anything over six stars will, will anything, well, anything we're involved in actual construction of will test uh, ourselves uh, anyway, just because it can. I mean, if if people try for it, often they'll go too far. So often we get we, people who've done their own renovation and they want us to come around and do the air tightness test just to see how they've done because they want to they want to know, and you you'll find out for them that they've that they've really made it really quite airtight, which is obviously good, but it's then something that they need to be aware of in terms of um, in terms of making sure they get the right amount of the right amount of ventilation in there, but. NATHERS itself just assumes a blanket, I think it's 12 air changes an hour. So, I mean, for the 10 star house's actual performance, because it's so much more airtight than that, it was probably, it probably does even better than the, than, than what the software, than what the software says. It's probably a, a good example of why NATHERS and the PHPP uh, are both valuable tools um, when designing your home. Um, this is a question from Elizabeth uh, and talking about like the form of the house. Um, she says, there's much more articulation than I would have expected. I'm interested in your thoughts on floor, wall and floor window ratios. Um, uh, so this one was, was designed, it's got about 25%, I think, uh, window to floor area ratio. Um, generally, for the higher star ratings, it, it, we, we can't go much over over 30. Um, and certainly in the energy rating side of things, if anything comes in over 35 uh, um, percent uh, window area to floor area, that's the one that we've 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 done more of. Rather than we haven't really, cons uh, I haven't got a figure in my head for the for the wall area. Certainly over time, though, there has been there has been studies. Uh, showing that buildings have become more regular and less articulated. Uh, and I think that's partly the energy ratings, but it's also partly that blocks have got smaller and there's less opportunity for, for uh, designers to put, um, put more uh, corners and, and things into the, into the buildings. But uh, if you're, as a very, very broad rule of thumb, uh, if you're looking to do a high performance house, then somewhere between 20 and 25 is, is what I'd be looking at. Again, I apologise for my um, son singing in the background there. Um, 
I, I agree with Erica that the Hubble tool looks awesome and I'm, I'm really keen to um, have a go myself. Um, where's the, the data that your the data and the Hubble estimations based on? Um, are they from previous energy rating or, or are they more kind of a generic information that you're putting in there? No, they're, they're based on, it's based on previous energy ratings. We had a tool that would do uh, tens of thousands of energy runs on the same building uh, in an optimization sense. Um, and so we fed that some millions of runs into a machine learning or like an AI type thing. Uh, and then that now guesses what the energy rating and the heating load and the cooling load are. So um, if we, if you want accuracy and we can train this, train the software specifically for a specific design, uh, and that's where that we'll get to 99% accuracy uh, there. Uh, but just in a general sense, if you're popping any any building into it, um, as I said, it's probably about plus or minus uh, plus or minus 10%. But it is based on actual NATO's runs, uh, and then it's been fed into an AI, into a machine learning uh, thing, and it then tries to guess what the what the energy rating is. Um, if you're happy to hang around for another few minutes, I've got a, I've got another few questions here. Um, uh, just in terms of thermal mass, uh, does it work well if it's not in direct sunlight? Um, this is from Paul. Uh, my view is that it just it detracts as it needs to be heated, and as such, if it's not in direct sunlight, it pulls from the house. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that's a, a bit of well. There's a couple of things there. One is the is the level of insulation. So, I mean, concrete is great thermal mass, but unless it's, and so is brick, but unless it's insulated, the heat's just going to go straight through it because it's not a good insulator. Um, and so uh, there is that. The other aspect to it is how you're going to live in your house uh, as well. So the, the concept behind that is, uh, and, it's, and it's liking for thermal mass, is that the sun comes in and heats the house up, but there's someone at home during the day to experience that. So if you had a house where everyone left the house during the day and then came back at night time, um, and then we're going to was going to turn the heater or the cooler on to get the house down to a comfortable temperature range, you'd be better with a, a lightweight house in that sense because you wouldn't then have to battle for the battle the the thermal mass to to change the you know, to make the temperature make the temperature comfortable. So so thermal mass is 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 really there for families that are, you know, people are going to live, they're going to be in the house all the time. Uh, in, an, in a natter sense, that's probably, that bias is probably a good thing because the people that are going to be in the house all the time are probably going to be more vulnerable. So elderly people and little children and these sorts of things. So it's probably a good thing. But it really, I mean, the, the amount of thermal mass depends on, uh, on, and its effectiveness really depends on how much um, uh, insulation there is in it and the, the use of the house. Oh, I had myself on mute, sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna roll these two questions in together. Um, uh, was an internal air tightness membrane used? You said yes. Um, and what was the uh, level of air tightness that was reached? Um, assuming that you, it's below 0. 0.6 because you said it did pass that uh, that number. It only just below 0. 0.6 apparently. And so I was talking to our expert air tightness tester. Uh, she's also our, our um, this, uh, Jessica Allen, who's also our um, expert passive house person. So I was picking her brain about passive house earlier in the day, and she reminded me that it got just under, just under point, just under point six. Look, anything under point six, uh, and I'm going to be controversial here. I think you're chasing ego. Because anything point six is a really, really, really tight building. Um, so there's a couple of other questions here, which before we wrap it all up, um, you said going from eight star to 10 star was probably not worth the dollars to get there. What were the main items that added the extra money to get it uh, to 10 stars? Increased window specification. Um, that's so it's all about glazing, that's interesting. Yeah, and and, and the, the in, in glazing, but also increase in insulation. So uh, if you put R4 in the roof, uh, and you go to our if you put our two in the roof, and you go to our four, you get a massive increase. If you put um, our five in the roof, then you only get a small increase from our, our four. And similarly, it sort of decreases our five to our six is less. So just trying to get those last couple of uh, megajoules uh, out of the system. 
uh, probably doubled the doubled the insulation and the glazing specification. So um, it's sort of law of diminishing returns a bit. Uh, and I'll throw one more question out there because it's about to get a little bit noisy uh, at my house. I might have to wrap it up here in a second. Um, further to the uh, thermal mass question, um, what about in heating climates? Um, I think my my understanding is that in cooler climates, uncoupling the slab uh, because you've uh, got a sorry that was my nineteen month old. Um, you've got a stable temperature around sixteen degrees in cooler climates, but actually gets warmer as you sort of go up into warmer climates. Um, how does thermal mass work in those hotter climates or heating climates? Um, it depends on the. It depends on. Uh, now I'm a. I'm. I live in Adelaide, so I've done enough work in in uh, the northern part of the country to understand that they look at things slightly differently up there, and they get really cross when people from the southern states or uh, come up there and try and tell them what to do. Um, but the it depends on how you uh, how you're going to use your house. If you're going to live completely outside, uh, then you may as well not have any thermal mass in the house. Um, if you're going to live inside and cool the house, then again your thermal mass will work as the heat as, as a heat battery, just as it does, just as it does anywhere else. Um, and so it really depends on 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 that. Um, and so it's very difficult uh, for often uh, to expect people to embrace their climates when they when they come home and have a, a very ventilated and open lightweight house uh, when they've spent the rest of their day in their car and in their office in air conditioning. So it's a really it's a really difficult, uh, difficult one, one, one to do, uh, I think. Um, and I do apologise for Elizabeth. She just called me out there, and I realised as I was talking that I actually had uh, that mixed, uh, that switched around. Uh, heating climate is where you actually need to use heaters. So um, in Victoria, I would assume in South Australia as well. Um, look, I'm going to wrap it up there. I'll just have a. Um, a little bit of a closing. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today and, and giving up your time to give this really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I hope there's more people who are out there, you know, trying to push the boundaries and, and build better performing homes. Um, it is interesting you say that, you know, a 10 star might not be the gold standard that's sitting around that eight stars, the sweet spot. Uh, and interestingly, most of the passive houses that we've um, and I, I can just speak generally for, for our, from our experience, the star rating on the passive houses that we're building around that seven and a half to eight and a half star, uh, they don't generally go higher than that. Um, but they're still amazingly high performing homes. Um, I'm gonna begin, give another massive shout out to um, the founding members of Builders Declare, given that we have no sponsor tonight. Um, that's Simon from Santa Bar Homes Building, Jesse from GLUX, Jeremy from Positive Footprints, uh, both Michael's, Michael Lim and Michael Murphy um, from Michael Murphy Build, Michael Lim Builders and Align Building, um, and Brian from iSmart Building. Um, don't forget, we also do a podcast called The Sustainable Builders Yak. Uh, on the latest uh, podcast, we're joined by Stefan Welsh from Stefan Welsh Architects. Um, Stefan was really uh, instrumental in helping us get Builders Declare off the ground. Uh, and he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, so that's a really uh, great listen. I'd encourage everyone to jump in and have a look at that. Um, our next webinar, um, we're going to be joined by three other members from Builders Declare, and we're gonna open up the questions to all our listeners to ask us uh, any questions um, that they might have. Um, we will be putting out um, a poll um, to, add, to throw out any questions to us before the webinar. Um, so keep a lookout for that. Um, we will be looking for sponsorship for the next webinar. So if there's anyone out there interested in sponsoring, please get in touch. Um, email info at buildersdeclare.com. Um, please join the Facebook page um, and also the Instagram. Um, Jim, thank you again for joining us. And thanks to everyone for coming along. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks, Hamish. See ya.